Inside Africa, in association with Zenith Bank. This is the Namib, one of the world's oldest deserts with mountain-like dunes stretching down to the blue waters of the South Atlantic. It's a land of extremes. Each year, more than a million visitors explore Namibia's spectacular landscapes, renowned as much for its natural wonders as it is for its wildlife. In southern Namibia, on the edges of the Namib Desert, one species stands as an icon for this wild beauty. These majestic animals that once roamed freely are now at risk. The horses are here for more than 100 years and just to let this population die out, it will be quite a shame. These wild horses have been hunted by a clan of hyenas that have taken an enormous toll on their numbers. If left on their own and unable to migrate as they are right now, I don't think they would be able to survive. Today, scientists say only a single foal remains in this region. There's probably a 50-50 chance that she's going to survive. With the odds stacked against this dwindling herd, activists and officials are in a race against time. So I hope something gets done urgently, that there's a chance for the horses to survive. This is the effort to save the wild horses of the Namib. This is Inside Africa. is a land of contrasts, from its northern grasslands to its southern canyons, from magnificent forests to its sweeping desert dunes. It is also home to a well-developed network of parks, reserves, and lodges. According to Namibia's Minister for the Environment and Tourism, a remarkable 45% of the country's lands are under some sort of protection. Out of that, we have 20 national parks um, that we manage as a ministry. Namibian law now protects all the species found inside its national parks. These wild horses hold a special place in Namibia's fight to free its people and its lands. The horses played a major role, not only from the colonizer side, but also for the freedom fighters. You know, you can take the south from the Witboys to the north, the Mandumas and the Mahereros to the east. They all had horses to help them in the fight against colonialism. Manny Goldbeck has been exploring Namibian history for decades and how these horses arrived here more than a hundred years ago. The diamond rush which occurred here in 1908 changed this part of the world. Diamonds were discovered at Kalmanskop and uh, it had a huge influence of this whole southern part of Namibia here. The ghost town of Kalmanskop, abandoned when diamond mining operations ceased half a century ago, has been all but overtaken by the desert sands. Because there was such a need for horses, working horses, horses for uh, recreation, for transport, in the mining fields. So the mayor of Ludwitz, Emil Kriplin, he started a stud here. And uh, there were about 300 horses in this area here in 1912. And he was breeding um, horses, obviously for the mines, um, racing horses, but also mules for the mines. Goldbeck has studied the Kreplin family and even uncovered a family photo album in London. Those photos show clearly, if you compare the horses from that time, more than a hundred years ago, to the current horses which you find at Garup, that there are characteristics which are similar. But there is another theory on the arrival of the horses that has its origins here in the desert at Garup. 
The other theory is that the wild horses came in 1915 when the South African troops landed in Lüttritz and they landed with 6,500 horses and soldiers. There was a pilot here, Fiedler, and he flew over those horses and threw bombs down there. And uh, obviously some of those horses scattered into the desert. The restricted diamond mining area of the Spergebiet offered these horses protection that allowed their numbers to grow. So nobody bothered about them because nobody could go in there. And there was a railway station, they were pumping water there. So they had a life of, on their own there. In, in the late 1980s, um, the ministry um, fenced parts of a Namib off. The fence isolated part of the formerly restricted area and it became a national park. It had a dramatic effect on both the wild horses and other wildlife because now the horses, as well as the game, couldn't move to the east, and the east got a much higher rainfall. So they were now restricted to that area. In the early 1990s, a long period of drought saw a number of horses die, setting off an outcry for action and a demand to save them. It was in 1992 that Telani Khailing first encountered these horses. They were at that stage planning to capture some of the horses and sell them to the public. When we were here for four days with, during that capture, I think the, um, the horses captured me. There was just something about them that, that I wanted to study. Talani is doing the research for I don't know, 23 years, 24 years. She lived for, for, for a very long period in the desert just to observe her horses. She has done her PhD on her wild horses, and she knows the wild horse population no, like nobody else. Talani continues to monitor the horses, and whenever she finds a carcass, she collects their skulls for study. Sadly, this is becoming all too common. There were 286 horses in the end of 2012. Before that, the population fluctuated. So during my study period, the lowest number is what we've got now, 74 horses, 32 mares and 42 stallions. The numbers have reduced due to the last couple of years, the drought and the hyena predation. Spotted hyena activity in the region has increased in recent years with devastating consequences for the horses. Now they are fighting for survival. All the time we have falls, they are getting destroyed by these uh, predators. Multiple failed attempts to dart or bait the hyenas and relocate them led the Namibian Ministry for Environment and Tourism to destroy two adults. Another died during an attempted relocation. That's a solution, the first solution we have in a short term. It was a decision that led to an outcry from some environmentalists and from those studying the hyenas. As long as people will continue traveling down the road and going to Luderitz. A meeting was called in Namibia's capital, Windhoek. I think it's the very first time where we get people together and looking for a long-term solution. And if the predation wasn't managed, increasing predation, if that's not managed, they will die out. If a horse is completely healthy, there's nothing wrong with it, in the evening and the next morning, there's only a few bones left. What is your assumption? They became a wild population in their own right and they left alone for over 50 years. It was only in 1986. And that's why as a ministry, we have to strike the balance. Continue engaging with the farmers there, with the foundation, with the local community, and with the lodge owners there. Searching for a sustainable solution to the conflict between the wild horses and the hyenas of southern Namibia. Thinking of banking in Africa? Think Zenith. In today's fast-moving, fast-changing world, you need a financial partner that understands your unique expectations. 
a bank with presence in major financial centers across the world, with the enabling platform to facilitate seamlessly whenever, wherever, however. A bank with best-in-class financial solutions from a superb combination of technology and human touch for easy, fast and secure banking that creates real value. Turning dreams into reality is now in your hands. People. Technology. Service. Zenith Bank. In your best interest. Today, Trump and war. Is his administration provoking a confrontation with Iran? And what's the end game on his trade war with China? Fareed talks to the experts. Fareed Zakaria GPS. Today. The vibrance, the flavors, the rich history. I always say Guatemala is a wild country. Experience the exquisite aromas of this lush Central American landscape. <laughs> A place where Mayan traditions come alive and creativity abounds. Everything is inspired. Color, textures, patterns. Escape to a lakeside retreat. We do have the best sunsets. And see living history in the middle of a jungle. Destination Guatemala, Tuesday on CNN. In a southern Namibian national park, a group of wild horses are fighting for survival. As scientists study these herds and the hyenas that hunt them, a simple solution seems elusive. Nan Kusei is a well-known carnivore rehabilitation facility based near the Namibian capital. The rehabilitation work that we do is mostly with uh, carnivores and other wild animals that come in conflict with humans here in Namibia. Their foundation's Carnivore Conservation Research Program monitors and studies a variety of sometimes misunderstood animals to gain insight into their behavior. For the hyenas of southern Namibia, the most significant threat comes from conflict with commercial livestock producers on whose land they've been known to hunt. And so we started focusing on that, on that conflict and how we could mitigate that conflict. Private landowners here killed four spotted hyenas in October 2017 and another six in June, July 2018. Nine times out of ten, the solution is, okay, you remove that individual. That one is removed from the genetic population. It is removed, killed, whatever need be. And, you know, you do the next step from there and see how it impacts that area. So the work that Carl is doing at Kanan looks at behavior of spotted hyenas. It looks at uh, spatial ecology of spotted hyenas. The recent two-year-long drought weakened the horses and limited the amount of alternative wildlife for the hyenas to hunt. While environmentalists understand the role hyenas play in the food cycle, the situation for the horses has become critical. The, the problem is, if there were no predation, the horses would have been able to survive the drought, even if we didn't survive supplementary feeding. But with the predation combined with the drought, there was no chance for them. The wildlife in that park, in theory, are all equally protected. Of course, the hyenas have a lower population, but a higher impact on the horses, which have a higher population, but you know, a lower survival rate overall in this type of environment. The hyenas generally leave their den and hunt at night, making their way to water holes where camera traps have caught the inevitable showdown, a harsh reality of life in the wild. What these images don't show is the efficiency the hyenas have developed in preying on these horses. Then in 2000, they took about two foals. Then it was quiet. 2003, they started coming in again and a little bit more often. During 2012, there were 50 foals born. By the end of 2012, the, the hyenas started predating on those foals. By the end of 2013, they were able to ambush and pull down an adult horse, which they didn't do before. The specific number for 2013 was 79 horses um, being predated on by hyenas. 
Piet Swichers and his family began farming here in 1983 and since the mid-1990s have been helping to protect and monitor these horses. When it rained, foals were born and they survive. Now it's a different situation. It rained in last year, February, and in May, foals were born, none of them survive. In Namibia and around the world, spotted hyena numbers are also declining. In a lot of areas like Namibia, they are vulnerable for extinction. The estimates in 1998 was two to 3,000 remaining in Namibia. Now we estimate less than 1,000 remaining. The Wild Horse Foundation is also trying to explore options that won't require hyenas being eliminated. Ideally, I would like to find a solution that works both for the hyenas and the horses. Unfortunately, the only long-term solutions is to separate the horses and the hyenas. It's either moving the horses, moving the hyenas, which is not really going to work because the hyenas will come back in. The only other option, as I see, is make a hyena-proof fence around the area where the horses are. But it's in a national park, so that will be a controversial issue. Hyena researcher Carl Fester has devised and tested a hyena-proof fence that might be a viable option. They don't climb very well. They like to dig. They're excavators. So we designed a fence or a fencing system which they could not get through to get to whatever bait we've put on the other side. If they learn something's not working out right now, they adjust, they adapt, and that is what they teach the next generations. So the, they are very intelligent animals. That's why it's so difficult to dart them. They're not your average, straightforward, dumb animal, like people think they are, or a scavenger. They are predominantly hunters. Though the two spotted hyena of Garub that were culled represent only a small percentage of the population, everyone agrees a long-term solution is needed. We can deal with one short-term solution now, but we must from that step on to the long-term solution. Not just keep putting, you know, as they say, plasters on the wound that need stitches. You need to, you know, get the stitches done so it can start the healing process. <laughs> The horse that carries the hopes and future of an entire community. The last surviving foe. Thinking of banking in Africa. Think Zenith. In today's fast-moving, fast-changing world, you need a financial partner that understands your unique expectations. A bank with presence in major financial centers across the world. With the enabling platform to facilitate seamlessly, whenever, wherever, however. A bank with best-in-class financial solutions from a superb combination of technology and human touch. For easy, fast and secure banking that creates real value. Turning dreams into reality is now in your hands. People. Technology. Service. Zenith Bank. In your best interest. Traveling is not just about seeing places with the most likes. We're getting iconic photos. Amazing. It's about finding the city's DNA. Meeting people who share its secrets. It's about making discoveries that wow you. And make you feel like a child again. It's a world of wonder. Look at it! Now go and see it tonight on CNN in association with Turkish Airlines. This is CNN. In the rough and untamed beauty of a southern Namibian national park, a population of wild horses fights for survival. Hunted by hyenas, their numbers are dwindling, and this population is at risk. Members of the Namibia Wild Horse Foundation have been monitoring this population for more than 20 years, providing supplementary food in times of severe drought to give the horses a temporary edge in the food cycle. I appreciate very much the partnership we have with the uh, uh, Namibia Wild Horses Foundation, because these wild horses don't belong to the government, they belong to the state. They are the state property. 
That means the uh, public asset. The foundation has also been involved in helping to maintain the water supply they share with Oryx and Ostrich. And we discovered over the first drought periods we had in the 80s and in the 90s that those horses need help in, 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 in those periods when the rain is very low. We got involved and it wouldn't, if it wouldn't have been for the foundation, the horses would have been in a much more critical situation than they are now. So the horses can go maybe two days without water, but after the third day they will start dying. So we were always big time involved with that throughout the years. Of course, it's our attraction and it's our obligation to assist. Recently, there have been calls to remove the horses completely from the national park. I said, hang on, how do we just take such a drastic step without even consulting the communities that are going to be impacted by our decision? Ideally, you don't want to move the horses away from us because this is sort of the area that the horses have occupied for the last 100, 105 years. With them being there as well, the local community has sort of grown up with them. If I had my say, yes, I would say move the horses, but don't move them out of the house area, but not move them so far that the communities who have grown up with them and sort of now depend on them in one way or another don't lose that benefit. Because the horses belong to the state, they cannot be moved without permission. And while officials and environmentalists search for a sustainable solution, locals here in the small town of Aus say they're invaluable to the community. And the tourists come look at the horses uh, that are staying in the, in the desert in order to see whether they are still alive, whether they still exist. Towards they come there to view those houses. Because of that, it created about 150 jobs in that community of 600 people. It's an impact. Now imagine if you take them away, I mean, these lodges will close and the community will lose jobs. Uh, really, there is no work opportunities in ours. The only work opportunities is our lodges. So if you add all the family onto it, there's quite a substantial amount of people living off the tourism. Many of the tourists who come for the horses arrive on cruise ships at Luderitz. They then make the journey into the desert by bus in hopes of seeing and photographing these wild animals. The grass is much higher to Lucerne. So at the moment we are in a very dire position. And the horses are well known, widely known, and people really want to have a look at them. As the search for a solution continues, the future of these horses lies with a few pregnant mares and especially on this two-week-old foal. Since I've started as a tour guide about 16 years ago, this has definitely been one of the biggest highlights down in the south. And it's a pity to hear that this is the last foal still alive. So it, it brings a tear to my eyes to actually think of driving through here without showing this to my guests. Delane Heiling knows these horses better than anyone and is realistic about the chances of this foal growing into adulthood. One of the risks is the lioness. Another risk is the tar road and, and a car accidentally driving over her. There's other risks that she could eat something that is poisonous that's, and she could die from that. So there's there's probably a 50-50 chance that she's going to survive. The Namibia Wild Horse Foundation remains hopeful. Maybe this year, after seven years, we can manage maybe get one horse through. That would be uh, one of the biggest gifts uh, for, for the foundations. While there is little room for error, many here agree that to save these horses will require compromise and creativity. You have different interests in the, in the matter. You have community, you have a farming community in that area that has got a different interest. You have uh, also lodge owners or tourism establishment owners who have got a different interest too. Now, you have to ensure that you create a balance as a, as a government. My opinion, of course, is that they must be kept in the area because they're in endemic to this area. Well, mankind, placed them there. Men diminished the living area. 
So now to turn around and say they don't belong here is maybe not the right way. We must preserve those horses as a heritage of ours, and we must do everything to protect them. You need to compromise from all sides. You cannot have one perfect image, no matter how much you try. And we owe it to the horses, but these horses have stayed there for over 100 years, so you cannot turn your back and say, c'est la vie, let nature take its course. Inside Africa, in association with Zenith Bank.